Hi, everybody. We're back with one of our favorite people, Tannis Hellowell, today. She's authored a new book called Good Morning, Henry, and we'll get to who Henry is when we get into the interview itself. But really what this story is about is in an age of misinformation, delusion, and disconnection, there's one way we can absolutely access truth, and that is through our physical body, the genius of the physical body. And that's what her book, Good Morning, Henry, is all about. So let's go to Tannis. Hi, Tannis. It's good to have you back. And what a wonderful job you did on this book. I can see why you felt so uh, exhausting, uh, exhausted putting this together because this stuff goes deep. You have to dig. Well, the thing is, it took me eight years, and normally it takes me one or two years to write a book, and then I feel complete, yeah. but oh, it took eight years because I had to go through the process myself. Yes. Yeah, and, and it isn't a learning process, it is a stripping process. Right, it is, and, and I noticed as I was going along with you, you could take this book and just go one chapter at a time and use it yourself to go through the stripping process. That's the invitation to everyone. And what I said at the beginning in this open, I think is really important. We are turning into almost a dystopian uh, society globally because of our lack of ability to connect and find absolute objective truth anymore, but the body does not lie. So, before we get into that further, first tell us why Good Morning Henry. Who's Henry? Henry is my body intelligence. And this is called by other people, the body elemental, Rudolf Steiner called it, Eckhart Tolle called it the inner body. Um, and it turns out that Henry is really, I'm going to whisper this, the Holy Spirit. However, we don't find out that Henry is the Holy Spirit until we're about two thirds of the way into the book. And why would that be? Well, because if people thought, oh, I'm going to talk to my Holy Spirit, this may be daunting. Mm -hmm. So he just calls himself Henry. Right. And in reality, as you get further into the book, you find that what this is, is that it, it is the intelligence that lives in and between the cells, that guides the cells, that guides the gestation process, that merges with DNA and RNA to program us for the lifetime, for the incarnation we're about to take when we're in utero. This is that intelligence and you can't sidestep it nor trick it. It takes the subconscious and all of our past into consideration when setting us up for a given incarnation with all the traits we need and the challenges we need. This is a vast form of intelligence that is informing us through our body, which is why it's so important that we learn how to listen to it, right? Absolutely. Fact, I, I was going to say, I know you have a comment from Eckhart Tolle that absolutely supports that because it's in your book. Do you have your book with you and do you have it flagged? Yeah, I do. Could you read that yeah. really quickly and then comment? Yeah. Um, Eckhart Tolle said, the fact is that no one has ever become enlightened through denying or fighting the body. In the end, you will also always have to return to the body where the essential work of transformation takes place. Transformation is through the body, not away from it. And I, I think this is very important because as you said, um, it programs all the cells of our body. And it, it's not just our physical body. Uh, when you're talking about Henry, it's, it's the etheric, it's the etheric. And the etheric we know is 99.9% .9 of everything. And so it's programming the physical, the emotional, which are all our emotions, and the mental, all of our thoughts. And so it looks at our karma from life to life. It works with the guides that are overseeing our destiny in this life. And it puts down exactly the right traits that will allow us to manifest our purpose. 
Yes. And what I found interesting in this is that it's a two-way street as we become and as we think. And this, this, I was really thinking about how does this line up with the subconscious? Because as we think and as we behave, feel and become, that in turn affects Henry. It does. It's, it's he pro it, it programs us to give us every tool we need, but everything we do impacts it in return, which in future incarnations will require adjustments. Again, can you explain this? Because I think for some people that can be a little confusing. Well, I think that we're we're going through a period in our evolution of humanity, which I call the dark night of the soul. And it's not just an individual thing. People have gone through the dark night of the soul individually for eons. Uh, but this is a collective dark night of the soul where um, all of our old knowns are falling away. And this means that we have to confront something that is at a deeper level and you talk about the subconscious or the unconscious and that is a larger amount of territory that programs us than our conscious and people have to start listening to their actual thoughts and and often people do this in steps. So first of all, they'll say to themselves, well, my God, my life's not going well. What am I doing wrong? And then they'll look at their behavior. But then they start looking deeper, deeper to say, where did I learn this behavior? How has it served me in the past? Why doesn't it serve me now? And then they start looking at, oh my God, this is the way that my dad acted. And how did I feel when that happened? And then you learn your life scripts. You learn where you got your beliefs from. And then you realize that this is all unconscious. So I've, I'm fascinated uh, with ancestors and how we we can track a lot of our patterns through our ancestors and and ultimately i believe that the cells give this information back to us i believe you're right on that and you can tell because there are sets of feelings and sensations attached to the cellular responses and those are the things we often ignore in favor of the mind yes. which going to allow our conscious mind, which is, as you say, far less influential in what we actually experience in life than our unconscious or subconscious mind. And then of course, this body intelligence try to guide us through life. And that's where we get in trouble, especially in times like this of extreme uh, manipulation and of consciousness, um, illusion and delusion, disinformation, misinformation. How do we know what's true, which has led to the last study I heard, 25% increase just in, in uh, 2021, 2021 in mental illness. Now we had COVID to contend with too, but it's part of this being disconnected from any sense of empirical or objective truth, I believe. Uh -huh. And I think one of the important things that I learned from Henry was that we have to create a pause. We have to create a space between what we hear and how we feel about it and why do we feel that, right? And the, the larger that this space can become, the more that we are in control, really, of what we think and how we are ultimately going to act because the action or the physical body, health or not health, is going to follow the thought. So it is a question of deprogramming more and more and more. And it's learning to become our authentic selves. So it's nothing more than becoming who we really are anyway, if you erase the programs. True. <laughs> that is true and i was just talking to a friend the other day who is having some difficulty um in a relationship in life and the reason is because she's been trying to 
deny what her body and feelings are telling her and say, it's wrong to feel this way. I shouldn't feel this way. Let's talk about that for a moment. When you're telling yourself your feelings, your emotions, and your body, you're not supposed to feel like that. And you invalidate it. What happens? Because often it ends up in shame, blame, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think any kind of negation of our feelings, our real feelings, is going to reduce our energy. And that's the least of our problems. So how, how much are we actually living the life that we could be living? You know, it's, I say that there's either fear or there's love. And when we're into fear, we're into negating something. Yes. And that takes a heck of a lot of energy. So it's, I am, I'm more of a embrace it kind of person, right? So it's not, it's moving beyond the bad and good to a higher frequency of, I think we are living in a paradoxical world currently. And so rather than dividing it into, you know, the haves and haves nots and the goods and the bads, we need to think in terms of how can many realities exist simultaneously here? As many realities as there are people, because each person has a filter and it's basically what I'm talking about in Good Morning Henry is to erase the filter. Let's start erasing these filters, which are these screens, these barriers that we hold against ourselves and others and the world, the world, and embrace in this kind of neutral place to really say, okay, there, you know, this person doesn't agree with me. Let's look at where they're coming from. That, and that is what we have really lost in today's society. Things yeah. are broken down into very much right and wrong, black and white, you're right, you're wrong. And so what you're talking about here it, it's interesting because it's highly nuanced and it requires us to be honest enough to understand that how we feel the other part is to collapsing into someone else's reality as a pleaser okay so you got both these things going on inside of us yeah. and in that like in the case of my friend trying to be a pleaser everybody is being hurt because it's inauthentic then you get resentments mm -hmm. and anger and so forth so if from what i'm hearing you say we all simply acknowledge what truly is being manifest through our body by way of feelings yes. and we start understanding we're all different. And, and sometimes we're going to please each other and sometimes we're not, but if we can't be authentic, nothing good. In fact, ill health will result, right? I mean, that's what usually happens. Yes, I think that's true. And, and I mean, I <laughs> we have been denying feelings for so long, mm -hmm. saying that the mind is superior, right? And, and the mind is not superior. Um, the, the mind is the ego. And the ego, basically, what we call our personality, our, our, our ego, is a conglomeration of all the thought forms that we've grown up with in our world, from our parents, what we've been taught in our educational system, what we're being taught on the media, whatever. It's a, it's a conglomeration. And the ego loves to stay in, in control of our life because it controls the illusionary life. It keeps us living the life of illusion, which takes us away from our authentic self. So basically what we need to do in confronting our beliefs and our old thought forms is we're actually confronting the ego so that we can become a soul infused personality. And our soul is nothing other than our authentic self. So if we say the mind 
And the world of ideas is one realm. Okay, fine. It teaches us how to question, how to analyze, how to critique. These are all important qualities. How to discern, wisdom, very important. Drop down into the emotions and say, are our feelings in congruence with our thoughts? Drop down into the body <laughs> and and realize the body now has to assimilate all of this information, but in a conscious way. Mm -hmm. And negating the body is negating the earth. And we have negated the earth. We're in a right mess right now because of how we've negated the earth. And if we come back into the body again, we are also going to come back into alignment with the earth and natural intelligence is the same as spiritual intelligence. Absolutely. And in this book, the book discusses the ego quite a bit and the quality of thoughts, and it talks about negative versus positive. And so what I want to do is get into a little nuanced conversation about that. It says that repeated negative thoughts strengthen the ego, it gives it some grist, something to chew on to control, where positive thoughts lessen the grip of the ego on us. Now, that said, you ha can have positive thoughts that are just, you know, mania, basically, pleasure seeking mania mm -hmm. versus a positive thought that's more congruent with your body intelligence, with natural intelligence. Can you talk about that for a moment so people can begin to discern between those two? Yeah, gosh, that's a really good point. Um, when you're talking about um, mania, it's trying to escape the journey. Right. And, um, and so when we have more pain than we have pleasure, we have two choices. We either seek the reason for our pain and change it, um, which is what I'm recommending. Right. <laughs> because it doesn't go away, folks. It doesn't go away. No matter how much chocolate, alcohol, sex, or drugs you do, it <laughs> doesn't go away. So find the reason for it or we do try to escape it, which the ego wants to do. The ego wants to get us off the journey. It wants us to get us off the track because otherwise it can't control us. And if we stay on the track of this unraveling process, it's not just pain that emerges, it's pleasure because the ahas, you know, are wow. And then we, just automatically start rising to a higher frequency. And we know that the DNA, when we're in negative thoughts, it contracts and it expands when we are in positive thought. And when we are, our DNA expands, we're starting to rise to higher frequencies. When we rise to higher frequencies, all of a sudden, our truth changes. Uh, people say, oh, I know the truth. Well, heck oh heck, my truth continues to evolve. And if people <laughs> look at it, they'll realize the truth that they held for themselves at age 20 is not the truth of age 50 or 60 anyway. So it's a continually evolving process. Absolutely. So when so I think you answered that well in terms of that kind of mania, which is to distract us. So we can tell the difference when we get all excited about something that is really taking us down this supercharged, manic, pleasurable road, which is what conspiracy theory, for example, does when it's actually super grandiose versus conspiracy theory that is simply reality that's being hidden. Those are two different things. And you know, because you can feel the difference in your body when one's just getting you totally souped up, like, oh, I'm in the know, no one knows this but me. That's a distraction. That's a manic kind of, quote, positive condition. 
I hope you're enjoying this video because if you are, there are dozens more like it on my site, all supported by people like you. So if you'd like to keep this work rolling in and join our community, just click on the Patreon button at reginameredith.com. That also gives you access to insider commentary, my live book club, and other live events with special guests. So join in. Thanks. Let's talk about neutral positive or positive neutral because this is talked about quite a bit in the book. It's, it's a little more Zen to find this place inside ourself. And then we'll let that lead to non-attachment and why it's important. You've really put your finger on something important. And that is that the ego wants to divide things into the thems and the us's. The ego is all about separation. It's about separation from spirit, separation from the earth. Um, you know, it's just us you've got to look after. You've only got to look after yourself, not others. So if we're trying to disarm the ego, we have to face all of our feelings of separation. And in, in doing that, we're caught creating in ourselves this pause. And this pause is what I call the neutral positive. And it's being non-judgmental, but awake. So you're still able to discern, but ultimately, call me a Pollyanna, but ultimately, it's important to have a optimistic view that spirit knows what it's doing. The universal consciousness knows what it's doing and that it will create the situation that will trigger each of us to change, to go from being the caterpillar where we greedy eat up all the world to the butterfly. And right now we are in the cocoon. We're in the cocoon stage of humanity's evolution where the caterpillar way does not work any longer. We know that, right? And our organizations are falling apart. The structures are falling apart. And so when you go into the cocoon, you start questioning everything. And in questioning everything, we've got to get beyond this blaming, shaming, the anger, the frustration. Let them fall on us, but, but, it, but be able to stay in neutral as these pass through us. We know that each emotion gets a certain kick, right, that we will get. And if we're getting this kick from an emotion, and a lot of people, as you said, are emotional junkies. They just want to get this stimulation. And the ego loves to create the stimulation. So when we get this kick, if we can just stay in neutral for those seconds without reacting, it will pass. The shame and the blame and the guilt and the anger will pass. And we'll be able to calmly discern what, what the truth that is available to us right now is. This is this neutral positive. Yes, and in your book, as you're writing about this, this starts bringing in the subject of soul. Because here we're talking about body intelligence or body spirit. We're talking about unconscious and conscious mind. And so as I was, I was actually thinking, you know, where does soul come into it? I think that was like the next paragraph I bumped into, <laughs> which is this objective witness that permeates all. So let's talk about how soul plays in and how soul can speak when we're in a more neutral quiet place within ourselves the the body intelligence is also the soul 
It is all of these things because it is the reflection in our body of universal intelligence. Mm -hmm. So it is soul as well. And the more that we move into this state of not blaming ourselves or others, just discerning and allowing this illusionary world to pass through us. I love what Sri Yukteswar said in the autobiography of a yogi. He said, because I have no preferences or expectations of others, I cannot be disappointed. How true that is. How true that is. <laughs> so, so if we re if we say, aha, I'll take back my projections onto others that they should be, all of our shoulds, should be this way or that way or whatever. I'm going to withdraw those. I'm going to put stuff here where we can do the work. This is where we do the work. You know, so I'll put it here and I'll look at how am I projecting onto others? what I think they should be, rather than looking at myself and helping, helping strip away and getting to this neutral place. It doesn't make us less effective, it in fact makes us more effective. Because we no longer live other people's lives, so that means we are fulfilling our destiny as much as we can see at any moment. The thing is, it's not as dramatic. <laughs> no! <laughs> when people become addicted to extreme emotional states, which is certainly a place humanity's in right now, that's what we've done. It's almost like a junkie coming off of drugs to pull yourself back, to even take that pause you're talking about, to stop and let truth simply emerge and, and not place the labels of good or bad on it. Let your truth emerge. Say it means that there's something in you that is, you know, repulsed by a particular place or person. Listen to the body, just let it speak to you. You don't have to judge it in that moment. Just let your body feel what it is, is it's simply showing you something. It can be showing you something from a past life, from something that had a similar vibration or feel or look to it that isn't that. But this to me seems the hardest part for us to just stop and not attach labels like, oh, bad person. I just judged that person. I don't like them and I don't know why. See what I'm saying? We That pause you're talking about, do you have some practical advice on how when we start feeling and reacting to everything around us as we have been doing, how we can move back into that pause, positive, neutral, place of grace, where you just let your reactions and truth be? Yes, you're, the important thing is your last word, be. Human beings are not human beings, they're human doings. Mm -hmm. So we're not good at the being state. When we are in the being state, we feel it as emptiness. And this is, a, this is a, once again the ego. The ego makes us feel this emptiness. So, so one of the things I do when I'm going round and round and round um, is I go for a walk. I ground myself on the earth. And I think that this is very important. And when I'm walking, often things fall into my consciousness, mm -hmm. which when I was sitting at the computer trying to do it, it wasn't falling in. Absolutely. So, yeah. So do that. Other people do it by running or they go to the gym. So these are some physical activities activities that we can do that can get rid of this kinetic, frenetic energy. The other thing is, I have to say it, it is meditation. They, they spoke quite a bit about meditation in this book. Henry spoke quite a bit about what that does by way of 
quieting everything so that the soul, so that the body intelligence can literally be heard, can rise up and be seen and be heard and guide us. It's so important. Talk about the other benefits, because I know there are quite a few more that were listed in there. Yeah. Um, contemplation. Some people say, oh, I cannot I cannot sit and meditate. Well, there are so many different kinds of meditation. It's perhaps just that the person hasn't found the right amount of meditation. I remember I was once with um, with a, a Buddhist uh, teacher, uh, uh, Rinpoche, and he said in the Western world, people have got so much uh, energy that they have to go work out before they ever try to sit and meditate. And so that is another another way of going about it. Um, I would suggest to people that they stop adding stuff. We keep so busy with our to-do list that there is no space anymore to think a uh, creative thought. And so it's 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 an addiction as you said and we we need to say enough already. So, for example, you go on a holiday and you race from place to place to place so that you get no rest at all and it is just a superficial glance at things. What I'm recommending and what Henry recommends is instead of going out and dispersing your energy, go deep. Realize that it's all inside and it's subtle. And we're not, we, we've been so bombarded by active, active media, which it's here we're on an active media, computer, TV, Netflix, radio, it's all active media, that it's an addiction to this stimulation. And we need to learn to appreciate the subtle and to realize this is the path to being. The being is going subtler, subtler, and this isn't less good. It actually, all the higher frequencies are subtle. They are. And well, that brings up the notion of being, uh, of spacing out, which we, we can talk about, maybe just address for one second, because I find more and more where I'll sit down and my mind is nowhere. I'm just kind of there, as you say, and almost empty, so to speak. And I'm wondering what is going on? I'm just empty. And so maybe that's just allowing space and refreshment for something else to move in. Maybe a quick comment on it, if anyone else is finding themselves more in that state of just, just literally being eyes open with no thought at all. Yes. Absolutely. That is one of the stages that we go through in spiritual transformation. So that's actually progress. It's not, it's not regression, it's progress. <laughs> because if we can't empty, we cannot fill ourselves again, or let spirit fill us is probably a better way of saying it. <laughs> So that is, that is, that is great. Yeah. Okay. I just thought I'd mention in case other people are going through a lot of, you know, spaced out time as well. Thank you. Progress, allowing space. It's not unpleasant, but let's talk now about what happens um, when we find ourselves, which we do mostly uh, people find themselves in the past or the future. And then they also get into patterns then of shame and guilt. Let's just talk about kind of the devastation of what guilt and shame does to our being. One of the exercises I recommend for people is to close their eyes and to look at or just get a number, any number of how much time they spend in the past saying, if only. Right. If only I had gone to university, if only um, I had had good parents, if only um, I had been born rich, <laughs> if only whatever. But how much time is in the past and how much time is in the future? 
for their life. When they say when, when I retire, I'll be able to do this. Um, when the kids grow up, finally I'll be able to do my own thing. Uh, when my boss retires, then I might get that person's job. Um, when someone discovers how intelligent I am, <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the when is. And when people look at how much of this fantasy they have about the when and how much regret um, or blame or shame they have with the if only, right? Or if only I'd been a good parent, if only I had been a good child to my mother, whatever it is, they'll find out that maybe they've got 20% in the past, maybe they've got 40% in the future. So what they're living with here, are you kidding? They've got 40% available to them because they're not in the present. I don't think that's unusual, Tannis. I think a lot of people live like that. And that's I think it's you're right to take as honest, as honest an evaluation as one can as to where you're spending that time to understand you've blocked all that energy. Your book and Henry states in the book that your your future becomes literally the decisions you're making this moment, moment to moment to moment, that will become your future. There's no point worrying about it. You're creating it with every thought. That's right, because every thought has a frequency. Right. So there's no reason to blame or shame or whatever. Just do it now. Right. Do it now. Right. Some other things that were mentioned in there is it's really important to try to keep your connections with people, if you can, ideally, to choose to be around people that increase your energy. Um, this is really important. In increase your frequencies. Now, that all sounds ideal. Wouldn't we love to just be around people that make us feel good? But talk about that in real terms, because we have life. We have all kinds of people around us. We do. We have family which we might have inherited. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and we do have obligations because that came with our karma. It came with our karma of who, who our parents are or what choices we had to uh, marry or have children or whatever. So we have brought these things into our life. So we do have obligations. And so I'm not saying, and Henry's not saying, forget it, just hang, hang around with positive people that you think are growing. Um, so it's a question of balance again. It's not an either or, it's a both and. So how do you meet people where you have obligations, where they're at? And rather than seeing the negative in them, see what positives you can find even in a difficult person. Um, because everyone has a soul and everyone is capable of growing and learning. So to focus on that, and I think people pick that up. They pick that up energetically when you are not criticizing and judging them. It doesn't come from the words you're saying. It comes because of our frequency. Mm -hmm. And everyone wants to be loved. Everybody wants to feel that they're loved and appreciated and that their life has meaning. So that's what we can do with people who we have a responsibility for. And then at the same time, the both and, to, to make choices, conscious choices of people we want to spend time with other than that. And are these people learning and growing? I often say when you put two people together, you've either got less than two or more than two. Right. <laughs> so what's a one plus one equals three? And those are the people you want to be with, with the allies, with your allies, with your spiritual companions. And sometimes people say, and this happens during spiritual transformation, Old, old friends fall away. Um, you're not understood often by old friends and people who've been in your life. And this is a very painful thing when this happens and you feel isolated and alone. This is part of the spiritual journey. However, 
when that door closes, realize it's got to do with frequency. Their frequency is not going in the same direction as yours. There's two things can be happening. They can become a couch potato. <laughs> and so their frequency is not going in anywhere, anywhere really. <laughs> or they're just going into other interests. They and realize that your relationship has fulfilled its destiny. And rather than try to hold on, hold on to this old friend, say, bless you. It has been wonderful knowing you. I will always love you. And move to where the door opens, the new frequency or the new interest. Absolutely. Um, and that's a really hard one for people. It's uh, with family, as you said, it's a little different. You find the best you can. That's what I find. I mean, I think differently, obviously, than a lot of people that I, I uh, was born into. Uh, the family I was born into, but there you have the kind of love that you that you're talking about. I just go to where they are, and wherever they're living, whatever they're working on, and you know you can say uh, some people think, well, how satisfying is that if you can't meet each other? Well, to me that is meeting someone. Yeah, to be there for someone in what it is they're working on and need and their wishes and dreams and desires is to be there for them. They don't have to understand me. It doesn't have to be about me. And that I think was the big transition is many years ago to understand it doesn't have to be about me to have a wonderful connection and friendship with someone and be there for someone else. So that's kind of what you were saying. Absolutely. Obligatory relationships. Oh, absolutely. And ultimately, our frequency rises when our heart opens more. Yes. And our heart opens more when we have compassion and forgiveness and deeper love. So this is what we all want. And we can practice that with, with someone on anybody. the street. Anybody. Yes. Anybody. I totally agree. And that expands everything. And so again, this non-attachment to, oh my God, I've changed. I've grown. They don't get me. Just don't attach to that notion that everyone's supposed to get you and understand you. I think that is huge in the spiritual community is people feeling rejected and misunderstood. No worries. Don't worry about being rejected or misunderstood. Just still show up in the way you can for someone else in that case. So meanwhile, in the book, we're just, we're, we're running up against our kind of time limit here. Um, you have a whole glossary, which people asked you about, about body conditions, health conditions, and the underlying emotional and mental and spiritual um, kind of issues that created that condition. So maybe just run by a couple of them. There are quite a few in there uh, for people who are curious, some of the more common ones like heart problems or cancer. Okay, let's look at heart problems. Um, problems with the heart is this main issue of um, feeling unloved. So, so rather than just thinking, um, we can either look at symptom or cause, and I'm interested in cause. So where is this feeling of unloved? Well, first of all, to realize that a lot of our feelings and emotions are not unique to us right? So that there's nothing really special about that. It can be that, you know, this is a major issue for most humans of this feeling of I'm not loved enough, right? And this gets back to the scarcity mentality that we feel that there's a scarcity of something. So rather than saying I'm not loved enough, I'm not understood enough, no one gets me, say, I love myself and I do things in my day to show I love myself. I give myself good food. I take myself for a walk. <laughs> I, do, I do things that nurture my sense of love for myself. And when I meet people, as you said, do I show love for them or am I just in my scarcity about me, 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 me? The more we love others, the more they reciprocate because they're comfortable with us. 
So often we've created that own, our own barrier with this feeling of love, which is causing the heart problem. Yeah. And, and breast cancer, cancer, we know that one. It's a growth. Reiterate yeah. that one. Yeah, cancer is a, a growth of something that we are we need to get rid of. Start at the heart, at the head, with the thoughts. What thought is causing your illness? That's the main thing I would say to people. It all comes down to what's the main thought that is negative or restraining, confining, not in alignment with universal intelligence that's causing your illness. And if you talk to your body, you get it. Your body will tell you. I I mean really it's not it's not nuclear science. No, it's not. <laughs> you just start paying attention again. Because that that the mind is so dominant, and we're made to be in a mental culture. And engaging with this this device, this computer here, puts us in our mind, mind, mind. You know, however many hours a day. So I love what you had to say. I, and the book itself has just a tremendous amount of wisdom. We've only done a tiny thumbnail sketch of what's in this book to give people an idea that this is a real directory, a resource guide for learning how to listen again and with the quality of thoughts and the quality of emotions, the space we give ourselves actually does for us in our ability to discern truth of all kinds. Any final thoughts, Tannis, before we say goodbye? Joy. Just enjoy your life. Yeah, I think that joy is is very important. And I've enjoyed our conversation. And this joy is an, an enthusiastic response to life. And whatever it brings us is the right thing. I agree with that. I'm all down with joy myself. <laughs> so Tannis, thank you so much for taking the eight years. And as you said in the chapters, I am so exhausted after dealing with each one of these and having to go through and basically excavate your own life. That's what you did in this book. And that, and that opens the possibility for us to do the same if we wish. I can't say I agree with Eckhart Tolle cannot have progress if we're going to ignore what our body is trying to tell us. We can't transform. I agree with this too. Tannis, thank you so much. I really appreciate you and your book. Good morning, Henry. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Again, everyone, the name of the book is Good Morning, Henry, which you can find on Amazon.com, a wonderful workbook for getting back in touch with the true wisdom that your body is trying to share with you. Until next time, thank you for joining us here on ReginaMeredith.com. <music>